right, so now we are at chapter 2.3, and these are the instruments of microscopy. So what we're going to be doing in this portion of the chapter is talking about all the different types of microscopes. Uh, we're going to start with light microscopy. And light microscopy, as, it as its name implies, is where we use light to visualize images. So in this case, what we typically think of, I think, when we think of microscopes is our, our typical compound bright field microscope, which we'll go over in just a moment. Um, but we typically think of using light uh, in a microscope in order to see an image. However, as we're going to see later on, there are several microscopes that do not use light. <clears throat> but we are going to talk about the light microscopes first. And the first microscope that we're going to talk about that is a light microscope is the bright field microscope. So this is the microscope that you would typically be familiar with. So this is the most common type of microscope that's used. Uh, it's a compound microscope. Let's see, so most common. Uh, how about most commonly used? It is a compound microscope. Remember, a compound microscope is one that has two or more lenses. So in this case, we're talking about two lenses. And it is a bright field microscope, meaning that what we produce by using a bright field microscope is we have a dark image with a bright field or a bright background. So this is, again, the one that we're typically familiar with, where we kind of look through the lenses, or we look through the oculars, rather, and then what we see is dark, and then we have this light that's all around in the background. Um, so we're going to take a look at the different parts of this microscope. So we'll bring in an image here. And here it is. So we have our typical compound bright field microscope. We're going to go through the different parts here and talk about what they do. So let's start up at the top with number one. This is our eyepiece that is around here. This is the eyepiece here. Um, but what we really call this is our ocular lens. Uh, because what it, we're talking about here is this entire piece here or the two pieces here together. These are the ocular lenses or the ocular lens. Um, so there are different types of microscopes. There can be monocular. And if it's monocular, mono meaning one, so it has one ocular lens, monocular, and then there is binocular. So bi meaning two, so two ocular lenses. Uh, in this case, in this image, we have a binocular uh, compound microscope or bright field microscope. So uh, you can see here it's binocular because it has two ocular lenses to look through. <coughs> So either way, you're going to get a good image um, with either a monocular or binocular. So that is where we start looking through. So up here, we have our ocular lens, and our ocular lens typically is a 10x magnification. Uh, so remembering from chapter 1, or actually the start of chapter 2 here, um, we have our magnification. So the lens that we have in our monocular binocular here, our ocular lens is going to be 10x, which is going to magnify our image or magnify our specimen 10 times larger than it actually looks to our eyes. Uh, so as we are looking through here, then you can imagine if we're, we're looking through the ocular lens, we can move down to our number two. Our number two is our revolving nose piece. So our revolving nose piece, basically what that does, you can see that there are ridges around here, and those ridges are so that you can grip it and you can turn it. <clears throat> you can turn it so that you can turn and see or use different objective lenses, and that's what our number three is, is our objective lenses. So you can see that they have one, two, three, it looks like, objective lenses, maybe four back there. Typically we have four of them. Um, our objective lenses are going to be also different magnifications. 
So we always start on the lowest magnification objective lens, which is typically the 4x. So again, the objective lens is going to um, magnify the specimen four times. But recall that even if here, say this is our 4x objective lens here, what we're doing is by using the lens that's in here, we're magnifying it four times larger. But then recall that up at the top here that we have our oculars, our ocular lens that's going to be magnifying it 10 times. Um, so in this case, what we're talking about is we have our objective lens magnification and our ocular lens magnification. And both of those together are going to give us what's called our total magnification. And our total magnification, if we were using the 4x objective lens, would then be the 4x times the 10x, which is going to be 40x. And that's our total magnification if we are utilizing our 4x objective lens. Uh, then we would move to our next highest one, which would be the 10x. So then what would our total magnification be for that? Good, so 10 times 10. 100x is our total magnification for that uh, second lens. Then we would move up to our next lens, which is our 40x, giving us our total magnification of 400. And then the highest power that we have lens on a typical bright field microscope is 1000x, or rather 100x, I'm sorry, giving us 1000 magnification. Back up there, there we go, 100x, I apologize. Uh, and then the 100x times the 10x ocular would give us 1,000 times magnification. Uh, and that's our highest powered lens of the objective lenses. So then if we are looking through our ocular lens, we're able to utilize our revolving nose piece to turn our ocular or our objective lenses and move them into place. We have our 4x, then we have our 10x, our 40, and our 100. What we're going to be looking at would be down here, we would have our slide with our specimen on it. So our specimen is whatever it is that we're looking at. So if we're looking at bacteria, that would be our specimen. Um, as we're looking through here, you can see kind of this metal piece here. This is where our slide is going to clip into. Um, so this right here and this right here, um, you can kind of use your finger to pull those apart to slide one to the side and then it opens this up a little bit. You can slide the slide in, put the slide in, uh, and then let go of this handle here and then it's going to hold the slide in place. This is called the mechanical stage. So this metal part, this is how I remember it because it's the metal part. It's the, the mechanical or M metal mechanical stage. Um, and then within that mechanical stage, we have our XY mechanical stage knobs. Um, so we have this whole portion that is our mechanical stage here. Um, so actually over here, I should have labeled it. Number nine is our mechanical stage. So number nine, because it includes this piece over here. And the reason it includes this piece over here is because if you can kind of follow down here, let me make it a different color, here we have our, our knobs. Um, so there's actually two here, and these are our X, Y mechanical stage knobs. And what that means is they move them on the X, Y axis. Um, so what we can do then is it can move things this way and move them up this way. And what we're moving then is the actual slide that's attached to this mechanical stage. So we can place our slide with our specimen on it in the mechanical stage. Then we can move the mechanical stage to place the specimen right below our objective lenses so we can start to look through our ocular lenses um, to see the specimen. <clears throat> so then when we're doing that, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we can move the entire stage as well. Um, so number six here is the actual stage. So what we're talking about is this entire thing here, the large portion. And then we can move the stage up and down utilizing these knobs over here. So we have a knob here, which is a smaller one that's inside of the larger knob. So number four here is going to be our course adjustment knob. 
And the small one here, number five, is going to be our fine adjustment knob. So our coarse adjustment knob can be used anywhere from the 4x to the 10x objective lenses, or when we're, when we're using the 4x and the 10x objective lenses, is when we want to be using our coarse adjustment knob. So this is going to move, again, our stage now, this whole big stage, and it's going to move it up and down to allow us to focus. So our mechanical stage is going to move us on the XY axis, or left and right, and then our stage is going to move us up and down in order to focus. So when we are beginning this process, we have the 4X lens, or objective lens, in place. We center our specimen underneath that 4X objective lens. We look through the oculars, and then what we're going to do is we're going to utilize the coarse adjustment knob to move the stage. Uh, so typically our stage is actually going to be all the way in the down position. So it's going to start in the down position. So then what we'll be doing when we're looking through the oculars and utilizing the course adjustment knob at the very, very beginning is we're going to be moving that stage up closer to the objective lens and trying to get it into focus. So then once we get it into focus with our 4X objective lens utilizing the course adjustment knob, we can, if we want to, then use the fine adjustment knob to make very, very small changes to get it in as best focus as we can as possible. Um, so then once we've done that, then what we would want to do is we want to use our revolving nose piece and we're going to move the 10X objective lens into place rather than the 4X. Once the 10X objective lens is in place, we can then again use the coarse adjustment knob because we're at 4X and now we're at 10X, and then we're going to move the stage a little bit more to get it back into focus. We can also use the mechanical stage at this point to move the specimen. As we're getting closer, we can kind of zoom in on whatever it is that we're looking for or looking at. Then once we have moved it into as best focus as possible, we can again use the fine adjustment knob to make those fine focuses, or that fine focus. So then once we're done on the 10X objective, then what we want to do is slide the 40X objective lens into place. Once we do that, now we're only using the fine adjustment knob. So the fine adjustment knob we can use at 4X and 10X to get it in really crisp, crisp focus. Once we get to 40x, we do not use the coarse adjustment knob and we now only use the fine adjustment knob. If we are accidentally using the coarse adjustment knob, we can actually run into the slide and can crack and break the slide. It's too close at that point. So we only use the fine adjustment knob to get it as focused as we can. Then we can move up to our 100x ocular lens. Uh, once we get to the 100x ocular lens, then we're going to be utilizing our oil immersion and the fine adjustment knob. And we're going to be talking about oil immersion later, um, but we'll be using the fine adjustment knob at this point as well. So you do not want to touch the coarse adjustment knob when you're at the 100x ocular or um, objective lens. All right, so then moving on, what we can also do in order to adjust the image or to focus it is if we're moving down below the stage here, we have both our um, condenser lens. So kind of the bottom portion here is our, oops, condenser lens. And our condenser lens is what's going to allow us to focus the light rays on the specimen. So it focuses the light. So it's bringing the light, which is number seven down here. Number seven is our illuminator, which is typically just a, a very high powered light bulb. Um, so our illuminator is providing the light. <clears throat> that light is going to be going up and it's going to be going through the condenser lens that is kind of condensing or grabbing all of that light to try to make sure that it goes up through the specimen. You can adjust the amount of light coming in by adjusting, adjusting the diaphragm, which is here. So here we can adjust the diaphragm. And that will adjust the amount of light coming in. 
Now, number eight in the text is indicated as both the diaphragm and condenser lens. So down here, maybe this, um, uh, this particular microscope can be adjusted down here as well. So we'll just label both because eight is indicated as the diaphragm and the condenser lens. So those are going to be um, what is going to allow you to adjust the light that's coming in. What will also allow you to adjust the light is the rheostat. And the rheostat is down here. So we have our knob that's down here. That is the rheostat, and you can that will go from you know zero to ten as far as brightness. Um, so this is going to adjust the brightness of the light. So a couple of other things that I do want to mention that aren't specifically labeled in the text at this point, um, but down here, this is the base. Of course, what the entire thing is sitting on is the base. And then here, this back here is the arm. And those two things are important because when you are moving a microscope, you want to make sure that you always have one hand under the base, making it stable at the bottom. And then you want to hold with the other hand the arm, making that stable as well, so that it doesn't tip over, especially because these oculars here, ocular lenses up at the top, can sometimes be loose because there actually is a little knob over here that allows you to loosen the ocular lens so that this can swivel back and forth so that if you are sharing your image with another person, you don't move the entire microscope on the table because that could get it out of focus. So what you do instead is you use this knob that's here, you loosen it, then you can slide the oculars to the side to the person and then tighten this knob back up again and they'll be looking at the exact same thing that you were looking at but you don't have to move the entire microscope. Um, so as you are moving the microscope from wherever it is to your table or to another table, then you'll want to make sure that you're holding one arm on the base or under the base and then the other one's holding the arm to make sure everything stays stable and it doesn't topple over. You never want to carry a microscope with only one hand. You always want to use two hands um, just to make sure that all of the parts are staying exactly where they need to be staying. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to move into... Um, some different aspects of our bright field microscope. So we did mention already the use of immersion oil. And we mentioned immersion oil in the beginning of the chapter because what we talked about was how we have these different refractive indices. And so remember we talked about how when we are moving from something like glass to air to glass again, we have this difference in refractive indices um, between the two media, and then what happens is we lose some resolution. Uh, we don't want to lose that resolution, and as we get to higher and higher magnifications, then the more and more resolution we, would, we can lose and things don't get to be as crisp. Um, unless, however, we find out a way to get around these different refractive indices, and we do by using oil immersion. And so our 100X lens I already mentioned is our oil immersion lens. So prior to using our 100X objective lens, or objective, uh, um, yeah, objective lens, what you will do is you want to slide the objective lenses to where there isn't a lens over the specimen, so there's actually the space up above the slide, and then you would add a drop, uh, one single drop of immersion oil to the slide itself, and then you slide or click the oil immersion lens into place, and then what that does is that actually creates that um, connection. So we have our objective lens here. And then this is our 100x, our oil immersion lens. And then we have our specimen um, on the slide here. And then recall that we have our light coming in. So it's moving through air, it's moving through glass. Then we're moving through air again and then moving for more glass. And so we have a loss of our image. So when we put the oil immersion in, we put a drop of oil, and then what that does is that when we click our 100 objective lens into place, then it actually slides itself into that oil. And so it's touching the oil here and touching the slide here, and so we don't have the air here anymore, and instead we have the oil, which has a closer, a closer refractive index to glass than air does. So then what we've done is we've decreased our loss of image.
One thing that we want to make sure of, though, is that we only get the oil on the 100x lens because it's made to use in the oil um, and not get it on other lenses like the 40x, the 10x, or the 4x because if we do, then it can adjust the, the image and it can, it can blur the image. Uh, so it's important to make sure that all of the lenses are clean um, when you put away a microscope, but also make sure that you keep the lenses clean while you're working and only get oil on the 100x um, because otherwise if you accidentally get it on the other lenses, then as you move back through or do other slides, you may end up having a really difficult time getting your image because you have gotten oil smeared on them and you're then unable to get a good image that way. Um, so that is our oil immersion lens, which is the 100x, and that's going to get us a much more crisp image than if we were to have that air in there. We lose a lot um, by having that air in there. Another thing that we need to know about uh, bright field microscopes is that we can stain them, and we're going to talk more about staining our specimens later on in the chapter. Um, but the way that a bright field microscope works is utilizing all of these properties of light that we talked about at the beginning of the chapter, things like the transmittance, the absorbance, um, light rays being reflected or refracted by different structures. Um, so what we do is we stain different specimens, and we can do that because these different portions of the specimen are going to react differently uh, to the different stains. And that's important when we talk about something called chromophores. So chromophores are pigments that absorb and reflect particular wavelengths of light. So what we do is we, we utilize different staining techniques so that we can see different portions of the specimen. And we'll talk about this more when we get to the actual stains, um, but we really see these different stains being used in the light microscopes. So depending on the type of light microscope we're using um, and what we're wanting to look at, we'll use different types of stains. And those stains contain those chromophores. So the stains contain different types of chromophores, and those different chromophores are those different pigments. And those pigments are going to be important because, as mentioned here, so they absorb certain wavelengths, they reflect certain wavelengths, and then our microscopes can pick up on those different wavelengths. All right, so this is kind of concluding our bright field microscope. So again, the bright field microscope is our most commonly used microscope. And this is the one that we, we kind of think of when we think of microscopes, a compound microscope. Um, some, the next microscope is very similar to a bright field microscope, but it is called a dark field microscope. So our dark field microscope is, again, also a light microscope. We're still talking about light microscopes. But in this case, when we're talking about a dark field microscope, um, this is basically a bright field microscope, but then it has an opaque light stop between the illuminator and the condenser lens. <clears throat> so then what happens here is that we kind of cover up the light, uh, the, main, the main beams of light, and we have this light stop and it allows the light to go around the stop, that opaque stop, <clears throat> And then we only have this cone of light that reaches the specimen. Uh, and then only then the only light that hits the objective lens is the light that has been scattered or is refracted by the specimen. And then what this produces are light images on a dark background. So like we said, a bright field microscope. Um, previously, a bright field microscope has a dark image on a bright field or a bright background. In this case, we have a light image on a dark background. And so when we think of our illuminator, remember our illuminator is our light <clears throat> that's coming up at the bottom of the microscope. And then we said that we have this opaque, remember opaque means that light's not going to get through it, so we have this opaque light stop. 
this is our illuminator. illuminator. So then we have the light that's coming up, and then it ends up going around this light stop. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any direct light coming up. What ends up happening is the light comes around as it's bending up and around this light stop, and then we have this cone of light. And then when we get to our specimen, we have our specimen on here, what happens is this cone of light is going to be scattered. And when it scatters, what it does is it actually bounces off of the specimen itself. So then when it bounces off of the specimen, the specimen itself is lit up, and then the background is all very dark. Uh, so we have our specimen here. And since our specimen is being hit with these refracted light rays, uh, so refracted light rays, then we have a light colored specimen. And then of course, as we move up, then we have our objective lens up here. Our objective lens. We also have something called a direct illumination block here. Um, we don't have to worry about that so much as long as you understand that we have this light stop here that's stopping the direct light from going up into the specimen. If it wasn't there, then it would be a bright field microscope. Um, but since it is here, then we have the light that's moving around it. Um, and now that it's moving around it, it creates this cone of light coming up here because we don't have any light in here. Um, and then that's going to shine it on the specimen itself, making a light specimen on a dark background. So this is useful. Um, it's useful when we cannot use stains. Um, so when we, when we do staining, that the procedure of using stains always kills the specimen. So if we don't want something to kill the specimen, then we can use dark field microscope. Uh, or a dark field microscope, because we can then keep that specimen alive on the slide, and then we just have this light that's beaming around this light stop, and it can bounce off of those specimen um, that can be alive and can be moving around in there. Uh, so useful when we cannot use stains, or when we would not want to use stains. So we want to keep the organism alive for example. All right, so the next light microscope that we are going to talk about is called a phase contrast microscope. All right, so a phase contrast microscope. This is going to use refraction and interference so things that we talked about as far as um, light and how it interacts. So refraction and interference caused by the structures in the specimen, and then it creates images without staining. So we're going to say uses refraction and interference caused by structures in the specimen. to create images without staining. So again, this is going to be another one that is useful when we don't want to stain an organism because we don't want to kill an organism. Um, so this is when we have no staining and that's useful for a living organism again. So in this case, what we're doing is we are changing the path of light. So we are altering the path of light. And by altering the path of light um, that is passing through the specimen, we can either <clears throat> have an additive um, effect on the waves or we can have a destructive effect on the waves. Um, so they can either cancel each out each other out or we can add them together. So uh, let's talk about how this works. So the first thing that we're going to do is we use what's called an annular, oops, annular stop. This annular stop is inside the condenser. 
So the condenser, remember, is where we have the illuminator at the bottom, which is our light source, and then it goes up through the condenser. In the case of a phase contrast microscope, what we're going to have is an annular stop, similar to the stop we saw with the dark field microscope, inside of the condenser. Then when we get up to our objective lenses, what we're going to do is we're going to use a phase plate and a phase ring in the objective lens. So we're going to use the phase plate and the phase ring in the objective, in the objective lens. So our light from the illuminator is going to then go through the phase ring and then our light from the specimen goes through the phase plate. And we're going to take a look at what this means here. However, what when we have the light that's coming directly from the illuminator going through the phase ring in the objective lens, and we have the light that's bouncing off of the specimen going through the phase plate, then what happens is what our eyeballs end up seeing is that it is going to adjust the waves. So the phase plate, so the phase plate is going to cause a lag. So phase plate causes a lag of about a half of a wavelength and so then the light is now out of phase. So we have a contrast in the phases. And then what can happen is, so we have the light or the waves that are coming from the illuminator going through the phase ring, and then we have the light from the specimen going through the phase plate. The phase plate is lagging by about a half of a wavelength. So then what we end up having is we have this wave that's coming from the illuminator, and then we have the wave that's coming from the specimen and if they are working together, then we have an additive effect. So additive. And what that means is if it's additive, then we're going to increase the wave. So we have the, the one wave, then we have the other wave, and then what we end up with is something that's much larger when we get to our eyeballs. Or we can have a deleterious effect. <clears throat> when that happens, or a destructive, then we have our wave that's coming from the illuminator, for example, and then we have our wave that's coming from our specimen. And if the wave that's coming from our specimen is like this, because we are half of wavelength off, if that half of, wave, of a wavelength is not additive but is destructive, so if they will cancel each other out. And so then what we see is something that's dark. We decrease the light that's coming through. So let's kind of take a look at this, what this looks like as far as the actual lenses are concerned. So down at the bottom, <coughs> we have our illuminator, our light source. And then remember, we have our annular ring. So similar to the light stop. And it is similar because what happens is we have our light coming around and it ends up being cone-like, just like we saw with our dark field microscope. So we have our light that's coming around our annular ring. <coughs> we have our specimen here then. And so then when we have the light that's coming around, similar to what we saw with our dark, dark field microscope, we have the light coming from here um, that is going to bounce off of the specimen. So then what happens is we have the light coming up from the specimen and it's going to go into our objective lens. Now remember in our objective lens, we have our phase plate and our phase ring. So we have our phase plate and our phase ring that are going to be 
shifting or adjusting the light that's coming up. Uh, so we have the light that's coming in. We have our phase plate and phase ring. And then when we have our light that's coming in, we have our, our diffracted light and our undiffracted light that's all coming in from the specimen and from the light around the specimen. And then what we see is we end up shifting the light that comes up out of that. Um, <clears throat> so we have some light coming up here and some light coming up here. This is kind of to indicate uh, the two different wavelengths here. That's wavelength. Um, and so what we have is we have a slowing of the wavelength. And so then up here, what our eyeballs actually see is we can either have that additive effect uh, or we can have that canceling effect. <clears throat> so they can add or cancel. And so then in our phase contract, contrast, what we're going to get is uh, a lot of really good detail on some very small things. So we can even look at, um, at organelles inside of eukaryotic cells, or we can look at endospores and prokaryotic cells. Um, we can look at some really good detail because the phase contrast is going to be even more detailed than our dark field. So our dark field is kind of general, like the bright field, where we can kind of see the circles that are cells. Um, however, when we get to our phase contrast, we can actually see different organelles within those cells, uh, and it gives us much more contrast. Um, and that's why it's called phase contrast. So we get a large amount of contrast, the darks and the lights, um, with the phase contrast because we are making those wavelengths be out of phase. Uh, so we can get some very, very bright brights when they add together, and we can get some dark darks when they cancel each other out. All right, so the next light microscope is very, very similar to the phase contrast microscope, and it's called differential interference contrast. So differential interference contrast microscope, or a DIC microscope. Uh, so again, very similar to the phase contrast where we use interference patterns and then we're going to see either that additive effect or that deleterious effect or the, the canceling effect. Um, so <clears throat> uses interference patterns, interference to enhance contrast. And in this case, what we're using are two polarized beams, which is where we have a difference in the direction of the wave of light. Um, so in the, the movement of that wave, we have two beams of light are made and they are polarized. Um, and then they are shined through the specimen and then they are recombined on the other side. And then the phases are different, similar to the phase contrast. Uh, but in this case, since the two polarized beams are created, this actually causes an interference and then it gives us even more contrast. Um, and so in this case, what we end up seeing is something that's three, more three-dimensional in appearance than it is two-dimensional. So in this case, we use two polarized beams of light they are created so we we create those two polarized beams and then they are shined through the specimen and then they are recombined with a phase difference causing interference. And more contrast. So again, this is good for um, live specimens, unstained specimens. And it gives us more of a, a 3D effect a 3D image compared to our dark field microscope, which still gave us a 2D image like we would typically see with our bright field microscope. 
Uh, in this case, we're starting to see some 3D features. And this one is very similar to the phase contrast in that we can see organelles. So we can use both the DIC and the phase contrast to use on unstained specimens, live specimens. Uh, they can see organelles and structures, and they have high contrast. The dark field microscope is more two-dimensional, whereas the uh, DIC is more three-dimensional. All right, so the next microscope that we're going to talk about um, is also a light microscope. <clears throat> However, it's quite different than the other ones, and it's called the fluorescence microscope. So the fluorescence microscope, as its name implies, uses fluorescence. Uh, so it uses fluorescent chromophores called fluorochromes that are going to absorb at one wavelength and then emit another at another wavelength that is visible light so that we can see it. Um, so it uses fluorochromes, fluorochromes, which are fluorescent. Fluorescent chromophores. And we already mentioned chromophores. <clears throat> so they are little chemicals, uh, molecules that are in specific dyes uh, that can adjust the light. So it, it changes the wavelength of light. In this case, what we're talking about with fluorescent chromophores or the fluorochromes is that they can absorb, so they absorb at uh, one wavelength and then emit at another wavelength. So in this case, or oftentimes what's used, it's called the excitation light. So there's an excitation light. And the excitation light oftentimes is UV light. So again, we don't see UV light, that's outside of our visible light range. So the excitation light is um, put so the dyes are applied um, to the specimen, then the excitation light is shown onto that specimen, and then typically, it's, you know, because it's not an illuminator, it's not a light bulb that we can see with the eyes, it's UV light or some other excitation light, we have this dark background. So the UV light is shown on the specimen, those fluorochromes which have attached themselves to the specimen then are going to absorb that UV light, and then when it gets to our eyes, what happens is it is that UV light is absorbed and then it's going to admit that light, but it's going to admit it in visible light in the spectrum that we can see. So this excitation light, typically UV, uh, then we require a filter to filter out the UV light. So to filter to absorb it so it doesn't get to the eye. because UV light is very damaging to the eye. So we have the UV light, we shine it on the specimen, and then there is typically a filter there to make sure that the UV light doesn't go to the eyeball, but what does go to the eyeball is the emitted light. Um, so in this case, what we end up with is we have an image of bright colors, fluorescent, right? So bright colors on a dark background. And so there are lots of different reasons that we would want to use this. Um, so with fluorescence microscopes, we can actually get down into um, some very small details. So we can actually see um, different organelles inside of an organism. Um, we can have high amount of contrast because we're talking about these very bright colors. Um, so the amount of fluorochromes that are absorbed by different um, parts of a specimen can create high contrast. But then also we have something called immunofluorescence, which is very helpful. Um, and the text mentions this in a little bit more detail here. So we'll talk about this as well. So immunofluorescence. So immunofluorescence is a method to determine a certain disease, if it's present or not. Um, so certain disease-causing microbes, whether or not they're there, we can tell whether or not they're there if we have antibodies that can bind to them. Um, so our immunofluorescence is a method to determine 
certain disease causing microbes or microorganisms. by observing whether antibodies bind to them. So we'll briefly mention here antibodies. So what is an antibody? An antibody is a protein molecule that's produced by our immune system. Uh, this protein molecule that's produced by our immune system actually attaches to a very specific pathogen and then it can do various things once it attaches to the specimen, which we'll talk about in a later chapter. Uh, so an antibody is a protein molecule that is produced by the immune system. that attaches to specific pathogens to kill or inhibit them. Uh, I'm going to put dot, 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 just because we're going to talk about that in more detail in a future chapter. Um, so our immune system just naturally produces these proteins called antibodies. These antibodies go throughout the body. Um, and they attach very, to very specific uh, pathogens. When they attach to those pathogens, they can do various things like help to kill them or inhibit them. Um, but we can utilize these antibodies in immunofluorescence. Uh, we can use immunofluorescence in order to identify whether or not this disease-causing microorganism is present in a sample or is not present. Um, so we can create a sample or, or gather a sample from a person, for example, and then we can apply antibodies to the specimen and see if those antibodies, which already have little fluorescence pieces on them, um, if those antibodies exist using our fluorescence microscope then. So there are actually two different types of immunofluorescence. There's direct immunofluorescence and indirect. So our direct immunofluorescence So our direct immunofluorescence assay is our DFA. When we have our direct immunofluorescence assay, as its name implies, it directly attaches to the pathogen. So our antibody, our primary antibody is stained with a fluorochrome that will attach to the pathogen if present. So this is our primary antibody, meaning we can take a sample and then what we can do is we can take the antibody, primary antibody, that is stained with the fluorochrome, and we can attach it to the, the sample. And if, it, if the pathogen is in that sample, then we'll see the fluorescence when we look at it under the microscope. Our indirect immunofluorescence assay so our IFA is very, very similar, except it's the secondary antibody that has the fluorochrome. So in this case, what we do is we apply a primary antibody to the sample. That primary antibody may attach to the pathogen if it is there. If then what we do is we wash it with a secondary antibody. That secondary antibody is the one that has the fluorochrome. That secondary antibody with the fluorochrome will attach to the primary antibody. If it does attach to the primary antibody, then that means we have the pathogen there. And the reason that this is 
uh, useful why we would have an indirect immunofluorescence um, is because we can have many of these secondary antibodies attached to the primary antibody. So it can give us much more contrast rather than with the direct immunofluorescence um, where we have our primary antibody is going to attach to our pathogen. We may not get as strong of a response um, if those primary antibodies didn't attach as easily or as many of them. Um, and it depends on how easy it is to get to that particular pathogen. Um, so in this case, we'll say that um, multiple secondary antibodies can attach to a primary antibody. So if we look at this visually, we'll say that, you know, we have a particular pathogen and in direct... What we see is we can add our antibody. Um, when we add our antibody, our antibody attaches to the pathogen and our antibody fluorescens, fluoresces. So let's say it's green. So that when we look at it through the microscope, we see this giant green fluorescence. Now, in the case of indirect, we have our primary antibody that's attaching to that pathogen, but then we have a secondary antibody, and that secondary antibody is going to attach to the primary antibody, and then it's going to produce that fluorescence. And so then remember, with a secondary, or indirect rather, we can have multiple secondary antibodies attaching to that primary antibody. And if we do, you can see in my drawing here, if we do, then what ends up happening is we have a much brighter response from our uh, indirect than we do for the direct. So we end up getting a really good contrast with that. All right, so the next one is a confocal microscope. Oops. And our confocal microscope gives us a, a very different image than all of the ones that we have discussed previously. <clears throat> so our other microscopes have given us kind of this two-dimensional, somewhat three-dimensional image, but what we have used as the specimen is a relatively flat specimen. We can't really get much in, in the, the depth of things when we use these types of microscopes. So the confocal is different in that it can give us depth. So that depth is the z-plane. So in this case, um, what we're going to do is we use lasers. So it uses lasers to scan multiple z-planes successively. So the confocal microscope is going to use lasers and it's going to shoot those lasers at different depths um, of the specimen. So then what we end up getting here is we're going to get a two-dimensional high-resolution image. Um, so uh, two-dimensional high-resolution image. And oftentimes, uh, fluorescence or fluorochromes can be used in confocal microscopes as well, or with them. So we can use the fluorescent stains, and then what we can do is we can produce some contrast with the fluorescent stains. So uh, uses fluorescent stains to produce contrast. So we have these lasers that are scanning at multiple z-planes. And then what it does is it uses a computer to put those together. So it uses a computer to kind of put those together and turn it into that two-dimension shape. So it uses a computer to put together layers. Layers into... 2D image. 
So fortunately also, we have high clarity in this image, and that's because it has a narrow aperture, and that eliminates any light that's not from that Z plane. Um, so it has a narrow aperture that eliminates any light from the Z plane. And so this gives us a really, really great image. So high clarity. So high clarity. Um, also, we get um, some flore fluorescence in there, and we can get some really high quality images um, with some uh, high contrast images as well. And so what this is used for, this is really good for thick specimens. For thick specimens. And what we would talk about in terms of microbiology, um, where this would be useful is with biofilms, for example. Um, so biofilms are large colonies, big huge chunks of bacteria with some extracellular matrix in there. And so this big kind of gloopy, gloppy clump with all these cells in it, um, it can be really, really difficult to look at or to use in a bright field microscope or dark field or phase contrast, any of those things, because it's so thick. So for thick things, we start to use the confocal microscopes and some other ones, but um, we can use the, the Z-planes, the lasers on the Z-planes, in order to give us a more, um, a better idea of what's going on inside of these thick uh, specimens. All right, so the next microscope is the two-photon microscope. So the two-photon microscope, in this case, what, why we would use the two-photon microscope is when we have really thick tissues. So our confocal microscope is really great, or is really great for um, getting into some thicker tissues. However, it's not really useful for getting into very thick tissues, um, for example, like embryos or entire organs. Um, so in this case, when we can use the two-photon microscope, uh, this is especially useful for looking at living cells within intact tissues. So as was mentioned, um, like embryos, as your text mentions, brain slices, and whole organs. And even mentions entire animals. So much better than our confocal microscope, which can get something like biofilms, but not like an entire animal. Um, in this case, what we have is we have a low energy excitation light. And since it is a low energy light, then it's less damaging to the cells. And with this low energy of the excitation light, we also have long wavelength. And with the long wavelength, then it can penetrate into deep tissues. So we have this long wavelength that can get through very, very deep tissues or entire organisms. Um, and then the low energy of it is going to be less damaging. So as we're putting this light, moving this light through, um, it's not going to be destroying the tissue. So we can still take a look at that tissue in other ways, um, but we have then already used it in a microscope. We can take a look at it in the microscope. Um, so this also uses the scanning technique, like we saw with the confocal. So it uses scanning technique. We also use uh, fluorochromes. And then of course we have our long wavelength light. So we're using all of these things to visualize these very, very thick specimens. And the reason that it's called two photon is because it has to have two photons strike it at the same time in order to excite the fluorochrome. So two photons must strike the fluorochrome uh, in order for it to phosphoresce, um, and then it can show us that contrast. 
All right, so that wraps up our light microscopes. The next section of microscopes that we're going to talk about are our electron microscopes. So electron microscopy. And there are two different types of electron microscopes that we're going to talk about. Um, the reason that we have electron microscopes compared to our light microscopes is because what we're talking about here are wavelengths. And remember that electrons, electrons can act like waves. Um, and electrons have very, very, very small wavelengths. So since they have smaller wavelengths, they end up producing a much better resolution than our light microscopes. So electrons act like waves. And then they have a, a very short, I guess I shouldn't say low, but a short wavelength. Since their wavelength is so short, they produce much better resolution than light microscopes. So they can get really, really high magnifications. And then in the case of electron microscopes, we can get subcellular structures. So even something as small as DNA. So our subcellular structures, even something like DNA. Um, so we can get something that's very, very highly detailed with our electron microscopy. It's also incredibly expensive. It's very difficult to get anywhere near an electron microscope. Uh, but there are two different types of electron microscopes. So there is transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope. So the TEM, which is the transmission electron microscope. For the transmission electron microscope, this actually gives us something that's very similar to the image that we would get with a bright field microscope. Uh, in this case, we have to have very very thin specimens. specimens. So they have to be very, very thin. Um, after they're sliced very, very thin, they need to be stained with heavy metals. They also are dehydrated. So this can be a problem if we have something that's very, very hydrated. So something that has a lot of water in it, it has to be dehydrated so that can adjust the way that the specimen looks. However, when it's stained with these heavy metals, um, that's going to decrease the effect um, from dehydration. So we have these very, very thin slices. Um, then we have stained with uh, heavy metals or electron rich metals. Um, so they have lots of electrons that can be interacted with when we shoot electron beams at it. Uh, they also have to be in a vacuum. So these things are in a vacuum so that we can shoot the electron beams at the specimen, and then we have an interaction with the electrons that are in the heavy metal stains and the electron beams that we're shooting at it, and then it's going to go directly through kind of the objective lens type of situation to the eyeball, which in this case what we're talking about is not actually the eyeball, um, but a computer screen. So with the TEM, again, we get something that looks somewhat similar to something we would see with the bright field microscope. Of course, very, very different because it is highly, highly detailed um, and we have great resolution. The other one is the SEM, which is the scanning electron microscope. So with the scanning electron microscope, now this one is quite different. In this case, we have electron beams that are being shot at the specimen, and what's going to happen is it's going to knock the electrons off of the samples and or the specimens, and then it forms images of the surface. So in the transmission electron microscope, we could see internal structures. We could see DNA. I'll put that up here. So internal structures. Again, it has to be very, very thin, and what we're seeing are those internal structures. When we see the skinny electron microscope, what we're seeing are the external structures. Very, very highly detailed. So in SEM, our electron beam is going to knock, so it knocks off 
the electrons from the specimen. And then that forms images. And also, just like TEM, SEM requires a computer. So we're not actually seeing this with our eyeballs. Uh, we look into a computer, look at a computer screen, and then we're going to see what happens and what kind of image we can produce after we shoot electron beams at either the inside or the surface, depending on TEM or SEM, of the specimen. So in this case, we also have to uh, dehydrate the specimen. However, we do apply fixatives to the specimen so that we don't lose any of that look so that when we dry something out, you know how it can get dried out and wrinkly and change shape and things like that. So fixatives are applied to the specimen so that doesn't happen, but we do need to get the moisture out of there. Um, so we apply fixatives. And then after we apply fixatives, we coat it with a metal. Um, coated with metal. So sometimes it can be uh, gold even that it's coated with. So we'll kind of, it's called sputter coating. So you can imagine we just kind of do this thin layer of metal, sputter coated with a, a thin layer of metal. And then it's completely coated in this metal. And again, as it's coated in this metal, we have a lot of electrons in this metal. We're shooting electron beams at it. The electrons are going to be moving and reacting when we shoot the beams at the electrons. Um, and then that is going to give us our image. And then that image again is very, very detailed. So some of them um, up to 2 million X. So uh, it's very, very detailed. Uh, we can get a fantastic uh, image from these. And again, it's the external surface. So we can see some very, very highly detailed external structures by utilizing the SEM. And we can get some high detail on the internal structures using the TEM. All right, so our last group of microscopes that we're going to talk about is called scanning probe microscopy. All right, so our scanning probe microscopes. We have two different types of scanning probe mi microscopes. We have our scanning tunneling microscope, or STM, and we have our atomic force microscope, or AFM. So in both of these, what we're using are probes, obviously. So uses probes to pass over the surface. of the specimen and interact with it directly. So in this case, with the two different types, what we're, what we're using here are probes, as the name implies, and we can have the probe go over the surface of the specimen and we're going to measure the current. So this is our, our most detailed type of microscope. It can magnify up to 100,000 or 100 million times. Um, it can get super, super fine detail all the way down to atomic structures. Um, so our scanning, scanning tunneling microscope, scanning tunneling microscope, so the STM, is where we have the probe that's going over the top of the specimen, so it's above the specimen, and we keep that probe at a constant voltage. So we, we keep the probe, the probe is going over at a constant voltage, and then what it's going to do is it's going to measure the electric current between the probe and the specimen. So in STM, we have a probe at constant voltage over specimen. And what we're doing is we are measuring uh, the current. So when we have the probe, what we have is a voltage going through that probe, and our voltage is going to then, or that probe is then going to measure the electric current that's happening. So measuring the 
Oops, let me delete the current part because we need the electric piece in here. So it's going to measure the electric current. So as it's moving across the specimen, it's going to be measuring the electric current between the probe and the specimen. So the electric current between probe and specimen. So basically what it's doing is it is, it, it, this is occurring, so the current is due to this quantum tunneling, which is why it's called scanning tunneling. So you're scanning, the probe is scanning over the surface, and then we have quantum tunneling, which is the electrons interacting with the probe. So the electrons that are in the specimen are interacting with the probe, and that's how we get this electric current. Uh, so in the scanning, scanning tunneling microscope, remember that the probe is at a constant voltage over the specimen. And then what it's measuring is the electric current. So what it's measuring are the changes in the electric current. So it's measuring that intensity difference. So uh, intensity differences. So it's measuring that current. Um, and so then we have the differences, and then it's going to map those differences and then give us an image. Now with our other type, our atomic force microscope, So our atomic force microscope, again, we are using a probe, of course, because this is a scanning probe microscope. Um, in this case, what we're doing is we are going to take the probe and it's going to be passing above the specimen, just like we saw in the STM. Um, but rather than keeping it at a constant height, a constant voltage or height, what we're going to do in this case is we are going to keep that at a constant current. So in this case, the probe is at a constant current. So rather than at a constant voltage or height, what we're going to do is we're going to keep the probe at a constant current. And what this does then is that the probe is going to maintain that current, that electrical current, and so the probe itself is going to be moving up and down in order to maintain that current. And so since the probe is moving up and down to maintain that current, then it's going to be mapping the ups and downs that it has, and that's going to give us an image. So what we're doing then in this case is we're measuring the movement of the probe over the specimen. Okay. So... In our STM, we keep the probe at a constant height, right? So we keep the probe, so let's say this is our specimen here, whatever this is, and then we have our probe, and we're keeping our probe at a constant height, and what it's doing is it's measuring the current as we go over the specimen. So it's going to be measuring at all of these different areas the current. So we're going to get the, the measurement of the actual electricity between the probe and the specimen. Now the atomic force, down here we have our specimen, and then we do have the probe, but the probe is going to stay at the same current, so it's going to be dipping up and down based on the electrons that are in the specimen itself. So what we're measuring here then is the movement of the probe up and down while it stays at that constant current. Uh, so make sure that you are familiar with those and you understand the difference. So they're both using probes, they're both using um, currents and, and measuring the electrical currents in some ways. With the scanning tunneling, we're measuring the electric current as we keep it at a certain height. With the atomic force, we are keeping the current constant and the height changes. All right, so those are all of the microscopes that you should be familiar with. Make sure that you are familiar with those, going all the way back to the beginning here when we talk about our light microscopes. Make sure that you do know all of the different parts of the light microscope, how they work, what they're called, um, how you use them. Make sure that you know your information about your dark field microscope, when you use them, why you would use it, phase contrast microscope. You should know the differences between these different microscopes, why you would use them, why you wouldn't use them, um, if what they're useful for, meaning um, live specimen, not live, contrast, things like that. 
our differential interference contrast, our fluorescence microscope. You should be familiar with the immunofluorescence. And then we have our confocal microscope, so our thick, really, really thick ones. But then when we talk about our thick ones, we can get even better and do the two-photon microscope. And then we have our electron microscopes, which is the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope utilizing electrons. And then we have our scanning probe microscopes, so the scanning tunneling, or STM, and our atomic force, or AFM. Um, so you should be familiar with all the different groupings or types, you know, the light microscope, the electron microscopes, the scanning probe microscopes, and then know the differences between those that are within those areas.